Joe here and today we're going to take a look at Napoleon 1807, the campaign in Poland. This is a game designed by Denis Sauvage and published by Shakos. And Shakos is a relatively new French publisher that has already produced some interesting and innovative games. And this game is a two-player operational game about Napoleon's campaigns in Poland against the Russians in 1807. And today we're going to take a look at the game and some examples of play, but before, let's take a look at the components. have the game set up for the Poltosk scenario and we will see the setup and go through some examples of play using this particular scenario which is the first scenario in the scenario book. Now in this game there's two kinds of units. There are commanders which are represented by this yellow star and there are cores which have the name of their core commander. Only cores have unit strengths and those are kept track of in these order of battle displays. Commanders can add bonuses to the cores with which they are stacked and there's a special rule that if Napoleon is eliminated from the game that causes an automatic Russian win. In this game, the strength and fatigue levels of units are kept secret behind these player screens that double also as player aids. Because we are uh, solo here in this uh, demonstration, we will remove the player screens. And I will orient the Russian uh, display towards me. In the Poltusk scenario, we place the turn marker in the number one turn circle and the scenario end marker goes in the number eight circle. We keep track of victory points in this victory points table. We see the French eagle in the zero box and the Russian eagle in the number 20 box. Whenever the French score victory points, we move the marker in the direction of the French eagle. So for example, if the marker is in the number seven box, and the French score two victory points, the marker is moved to the number five box. Conversely, Russian victory points move the marker in the direction of the Russian eagle. So if two victory points are scored by the Russians, the marker would be moved to the number nine box. Automatic victory can be achieved whenever the marker enters the zero box. In that case, the French immediately win. Conversely, if the victory point marker ever enters the number 20 box, 
the Russians win an automatic victory. In this particular scenario, there is a possibility of a draw. The scenario calls for the placement of three white discs in the 8, 9, and 10 boxes, and the victory point marker starts in the number 10 box. If it ends in any box with a white disc, the game is a draw. If the game ends and the marker is in any of boxes 11 through 19, the Russians win. And if the game ends and the marker is in any of boxes 1 through 7, the French win. Victory points are awarded during the game by destroying enemy strength points, either infantry or cavalry strength points, or by occupying enemy controlled uh, victory point locations, such as fortified towns and citadels. So let's say, for example, that in combat, Ogoro's corps loses two blue or infantry strength cubes. The victory point marker is moved two spaces in the direction of the Russian eagle to the number 12 box. In this game, victory points are awarded immediately upon the elimination of enemy strength points and also occupying enemy fortified towns. Here we see the fortified town of Elbing under Russian control, as denoted by the Russian flag. If during his turn the French player moves Bessier's corps there, the fortified town would change control and we would place a French flag to signify French control and the French would immediately receive its victory point value of 1. In some scenarios, certain citadels begin the game besieged. Here we see the Russian citadel of Danzig, and there's a siege marker, which is the yellow blast marker underneath. This means that Danzig is being besieged by French forces. If at the end of the game, that siege marker is still there, the French gain the victory points for Danzig, which in this case are two. Also, victory points are awarded if a citadel is occupied by an enemy core. Here we see the French citadel of Thorn, and if at the end of the game a Russian corps such as Bagovuts occupies that space, then the Russians receive Thorn's victory point value, which is also two. Also, in each scenario, there are special rules, and sometimes these special rules are special victory conditions. Like in this scenario, that you only earn victory points by controlling the Grodans and Thorn Citadels, as well as the Osterode fortified town. And also, in this scenario, if the Russians ever control Warsaw, that begins as a French citadel, they immediately win. And if the French control Rosan, they immediately win. But if neither these immediate victory conditions apply, nor the score ever reaches 0 or 20, you play the game to its conclusion, and the final location of the victory point marker will determine whether it's a French or Russian victory, or a draw in case that it ends up where the white discs are. Now this is not a card driven game but cards enhance play and depending on the scenario that you are playing you build your deck at the beginning of the game. For example this is the Poltosk scenario and here we see three French cards that have a P printed on them meaning that these are added to the cards in the Poltusk scenario. So we will add them to the th 39 cards that have no such markings on the French side. And we also have these three cards that are added to this scenario to the Russian deck. And we shuffle both decks. 
there are other cards that may begin uh, placed on the board. Let's take a look at them. In the case that a specific event triggers mud effects, there is the mud card that begins this scenario face down in its space. If mud effects are triggered, then that card is placed face up. And here you see how that card can be triggered. It's at the beginning of a turn if a rain or snow event has been played in a preceding turn. But for now, at the beginning of the game, the mud card starts in its space face down. Also at the beginning of the game, both forces are in their winter quarters and that is signified by this winter quarters card placed face up in its corresponding space. This is the space near the French edge of the board. The Russians also begin the game with a winter quarters card placed face up in their corresponding space on the board. Here we see the main French forces at Warsaw. Napoleon has Lefebvre, Lan, and Murat's corps there. And Davout's corps has already crossed the Vistula River. The Russians have blown the bridges in front of Davout's march, and that is signified by the two red cubes. The Russians have the cores of Osterman and also Bagovut awaiting for Davout. Sakin is a little behind, and the main Russian force is behind. You see Russian commander Kamensky together with Benningsen and also you see Galitzin's corps at Poltusk and further behind at Rosen is Buxauden with Dokturov as well as Olsufiev and Essen III. Tuchkov's corps is also nearby. The French have additional forces as you see here the corps of Ogoro as well as Solt and you see Bessier, which is at Siorp. And then further to the west, there is the French citadel of Thorn with Bernadotte, which is nearby the Russian citadel of Grodens. Further to the east at Strasbourg is Ney, and close to Ney is Lestocq's Russian corps at Lautenberg. And if we keep on uh, going into a northerly direction, we see the fortified towns that are worth victory points. Those are namely Heilsberg, Allenstein, Osterode, and on the Baltic coast, Elbing, and of course, the Russian citadel of Konigsberg, and also the Russian citadel of Danzig. Here we see the Russian strength and fatigue display. You see, for example, that uh, Bagovut starts with three green or infantry strength cubes and two pink or cavalry strength cubes. And of course, uh, elimination of strength cubes will provide uh, victory points to the enemy. And here we see the uh, starting strength of the French forces in the case of the French infantry is represented by blue cubes and cavalry by yellow cubes. Here we see that in the Poltusk scenario Napoleon is the overall commander of the French forces that number 30 infantry and 11 cavalry strength cubes. Napoleon provides certain bonuses as denoted there by the symbols. The marching soldier means that Napoleon's uh, stack gets a plus one to its movement point allowance. The card with the plus one means that if he's involved in combat, he adds one combat card to his side. And the orange circle with the cross means that he reduces fatigue by one whenever he is involved in movement. Here we see the commanders of the Russian forces that number 26 infantry and 11 cavalry cubes. Kamensky has a 
soldier, a marching soldier with a crossed out symbol. That means that he uh, inflicts a penalty on the stack which moves with him by reducing their movement allowance by one. Benningsen and Buxauden, however, provide an additional combat card whenever they are involved in combat. Now this game is played in turns and each turn is divided into specific phases. The first phase is the draw phase, followed by the initiative phase, followed by the operations phase, and finally you have the recovery phase. During the draw phase, each side draws three cards. So let's suppose that each side now draws three cards, and of course each side keeps secret the composition of the cards that it draws. And let's say that these are the cards that each side drew. During the draw phase, only cards that have a red background can be played and must be played. Now, in this case, the French drew the rain card, which has a red background. So that means that this card has to be played for its effect during the draw phase. And this specific card says that any stack that is activated during this turn suffers one additional fatigue point immediately, and any moving stack loses one movement point. So let's say that this card is played immediately for its effect because it is a red card and red cards can only be played for their effect during the draw phase. Now let's suppose that in our example the Russians also drew a red card. Whenever there are more than one red card drawn either by one player or both all red cards cancel each other out and there is no event played as a result. So in this case, the rain card that was drawn by the French and the inactivity card drawn by the Russians are discarded and no event uh, of these cards will take effect during the draw phase. But let's go back to our original example where only the French drew a red card, the rain card, and that card is played for its effect, as we stated before, and is discarded. The next phase in the game is the initiative phase. And in this phase, only cards that have a blue background may be played if the player wants to play such a card. So in this particular situation, the Russians, if they wanted to, they could play their for the Tsar card during this phase. And let's say that they do so. So this card is played for the event and the Russian player immediately removes one fatigue point from all the cores of a stack of their choice. And after playing this card, this card is also discarded. The initiative phase, both players draw the top card from their decks and the player that draws the higher numbered card will go first in the operations phase. In this example, the French drew a three and the Russians a two, so the French will go first. And if both players draw the same number, the French always go first in the case of ties. During the operation phase, units may conduct movement, initiate combat, or they can move and initiate combat. Let's take a look at the example of play found in the rulebook. There is a stack of French units at Gildenberg, namely a commander, Napoleon, and two corps, one under Soult and the other one under Bessier. And there are nearby Russian forces, and also Ney, is to the east of Soldat. So the French player selects the stack at Gildenberg as the, the next area where he will conduct actions. And when doing so, the French player has to decide if all non-activated units will be activated or not. So the French player could activate Napoleon 
and the two cores, or just activate, uh, for instance, Napoleon and Bessier and not activate Salt. But the French player has to announce which cores and commanders will be activated before drawing a card. And the card will determine uh, the base number of movement points that the stack will have during this operations phase. Let's say, for purposes of our example, that the French player will activate Napoleon as commander and both cores. So now we draw a card from the top of the French deck. And we take into account the number in the top right-hand corner. In this case, it's a four. Now we apply modifiers. Napoleon has a marching soldier symbol that means that he adds one movement point to the stack which he accompanies. Uh, so that stack will move now five movement points. However, Bessier also has that symbol, but because there is more than one core being moved, that symbol of a marching soldier that Bessier has does not contribute its bonus. Now, let's suppose that instead of the French activating all three units, it would have activated only Napoleon and Bessier. In that case, we would start with the card's value of four plus the marching soldier symbol that applies to Bessier. That would be a five. And we would add a plus one because of the marching soldier symbol of Napoleon. So. Napoleon and Bessier moving together without salt would have six movement points. Now, if only salt was activated, he would move with four movement points. And if salt were activated together with Napoleon, then that stack would have five movement points, that is four for the card, and the movement bonus that Napoleon adds, which is one additional movement point. But continuing with the example, in this case, the whole French stack will move. Napoleon with Salt's core and Bessier's core. And the stack has four movement points. So let's see what options they have. In this game, movement from one area to another cost one movement point with the exception of when a stack of units moves into an area by crossing a broken bridge like the one here. In that case, movement from the starting area to the next area across the broken bridge cost three movement points. Back to our example, the French have various routes they could take the option of moving in this direction, expending all four movement points. And after that, we would invert all units to their activated side. Another option is to move into Soldau and join with Ney's core, in which case the stack would have to stop because it entered a space occupied by a friendly core. And that would end the phase for the stack and we would invert the counters. And the other alternative is that the stack could move into Lautenberg and continue moving and enter the space where Essen's core is located. In that case, the stack has to also stop moving because it entered a space occupied by an enemy core. And we would invert the uh, French blocks to their backside. Let's say that that was the move that the French chose. In that event, the French have to designate their axis of retreat. And that is done whenever a stack of unit enters a space containing enemy units. It must stop. And we place this wooden arrow pointing to the direction of the area from which 
the stack uh, move prior to entering the area with the enemy unit, which in this case is Lautenberg. The axis of retreat means that in the case of combat and a French retreat, the French have to retreat in the direction where the arrow points, that is, into Lautenberg. Now, let's say that in the next Russian operation, the Russians activate Essen for movement. Essen cannot move in the same route as the French axis of retreat, that is, Essen cannot move from where that core is into Lautenberg. It could move to this space, or it could move into or through the wooded area space shown here. And of course, whenever Essen finishes his activation, we flip his block to his activated side. Let's take a look now at the combat example found in the rulebook. Here we see at Eilau that the Russians have three units. One is a commander and two corps, and one of the corps has already been activated. Lan is also in the space. Lan entered the space in a previous uh, operations phase by way of Landsberg, and that's why we have the axis of retreat arrow, uh, blue arrow, French arrow, pointing to Landsberg. Here we see all three Russian units, the commander, Benigsen, there's also al Sufiev, and both of these units have not been activated yet. And then the activated unit is Osterman's core. So now it's the beginning of the French player's turn, and the French player won the initiative and decides to fight. And in this game, contrary to other games, when you move one of your cores onto a space with enemy cores, combat is not automatic. You may initiate combat, but with a penalty. It's called a moving attack, and you lose one card. The French now have their turn. They won the initiative, and now they announce that Lan will attack the Russian forces in Eilau. Here we see the French order of battle. Lan here has five strength points, four of infantry and one of cavalry, and Lan also has a plus one card bonus in battle. And his core has one fatigue token. Here we see the order of battle of the Russians. Old Sufiev has three strength cubes, two of infantry, one of cavalry, and four fatigue cylinders. Osterman has three infantry cubes, and six fatigue cylinders. And because he has six fatigue cylinders, he's reached this space that uh, subtracts one combat card from the Russian side. So uh, that's a penalty that the Russians will have in the upcoming combat. So the French player decides to play a combat card and plays this one, Skirmishers. Notice the uh, crossed sword symbol, meaning that this is the kind of card that can be played during combat. And as a result of this card, the Russian stack suffers one fatigue point immediately. So the Russians have to decide to whom to give the fatigue cylinder, to Ol Sufiev or Osterman's core. If it is given to Ol Sufiev's core, then there will be a minus one card penalty in combat. So it's given to Osterman. Now we determine how many combat cards the French will draw. Land's core has a strength of five, four infantry and one cavalry cube. So that puts them in this zone where Lan will draw two cards as a result of his core's strength. And in addition, Land provides a bonus of one additional card. So the French will draw three cards. On the Russian side, on account of Ol Sufiev, Ol Sufiev uh, causes one card to be drawn. You see the symbol there because he has a strength of three. 
Osterman also has a strength of three, so that's an additional card, so we're at two, but because of his fatigue level, we subtract one, so we're back to one. But also present is one of the Russian commanders, Benigzen, who has a combat bonus of one card, so the Russians will draw two cards. So we start with the French cards, we draw three cards, one at a time, and we consult the combat result, which is this area here, symbolized by this cannon. And we see that the French inflict a fatigue point and a strength point loss on the Russians. The second card drawn adds one more fatigue point. And the third card, another fatigue point, which is three, and a second strength point loss on the Russians. Now we flip two cards from the Russian deck. The first card inflicts two fatigue hits on Lance Corps. And the second card inflicts two more fatigue hits. So the hits are applied simultaneously. We start with the French combat results on the Russian force, which were three fatigue points. And fatigue points are distributed equally between the forces. So all Suviev and Osterman each will receive one, and the remaining fatigue hit can be allocated to any of the cores. So in order to avoid Osterman's core from being eliminated, because it would be the uh, ninth fatigue point hit, it will be given to all Suviev. Now we have to remove two strength cubes from the Russian force as a result of the French uh, combat result. And because the result was more than one strength loss and there's cavalry present, we have to eliminate at least one cavalry cube. So we will remove all Sufiev's cavalry cube. And we can remove uh, the second strength point from any of the Russian corps, so we will eliminate one of Osterman's infantry strength points. And because the Russians lost two victory points, the French score two victory points in their favor. And we signify that by moving the victory point marker two spaces to the number eight box. Now we implement the Russian combat result against the French, which was four fatigue points, and we add them to Lan's core on the display. And now Lan has five fatigue points. Now the Russian stack here lost the battle because it suffered more losses than the French. Two strength point losses and the French zero. So now the Russians have to retreat from the space However, the French currently have more cavalry than the Russians. Lan has one cavalry strength point and the Russians none because the one they had had to be taken as a strength point loss. That means that a pursuit now will happen with the French forces pursuing the retreating Russians. And we resolve pursuits by flipping a card from the French deck and implementing the combat result. And the result is that the Russians suffered two more fatigue hits. Fatigue points must be distributed evenly, so all Sufiev's core receives one, now has a total of seven, and Osterman's core receives the second fatigue point hit. And that causes Osterman's core to be eliminated because the token reached the skull space. So Osterman's core is removed. So we remove his core marker from the map. And his two infantry strength points as well as all fatigue markers from Osterman's space in the order of battle. Because in the pursuit, two more Russian strength points were lost, the French score two victory points, and the marker now moves to the number six box. Now we conduct the retreat of the Russian force 
the combat result was a loss of two strength points for the Russians, zero for the French. So the difference determines the length of the retreat in terms of areas. And the Russians have to retreat two areas and may not cross the axis of retreat of the French. That means they cannot retreat into Landsberg. So the Russians retreat their force two areas into Friedland and we finish by flipping all the units that participated in the combat to their activated sides. And notice that this particular turn was initiated by Lan announcing that uh, his corps was attacking the Russians there at Eilau. And uh, Lan was in the same space with the Russians. However, if Lan had moved during this turn into that space, Lan could have attacked the Russians also, but as a moving attack, there would be a penalty of one less card drawn during combat for the French. So during the operations phase, players alternate conducting operations with their stacks until both players pass. And in that case, we proceed to the recovery phase. Let's take a look at the recovery example found in the rulebook. In this example, both players have passed. So we begin with the recovery phase. The French player does not have any cards left because you can use cards to conduct recovery of units. And recovery of units is another way of saying removing fatigue hits from the order of battle of the units. The Russians do have one card that they will play during the recovery phase. The Russians will play this card, Strategic Retreat. Notice that it is a blue card, meaning that it can be played for the event during the initiative phase. But for this purpose, during recovery, the Russians can play this card and you implement the result shown there with the wagon, which means that two fatigue points are removed and the Russians will remove two fatigue points from Olsuviev's force, which currently has six. And by removing those two fatigue points, now Olsuviev does not have that minus one card penalty in battle. Not shown in the game rules, but as an extension of this example, during this phase, you can also remove all fatigue points of any unit that was not activated during the turn. So let's say that the uh, operations phase is over. We start the, with the recovery phase and Dokturov's core was never activated and that is signified by his block being face up. That means that we can remove all fatigue point hits from Dokturov's display. And for this, you don't need a card. So just having a unit uh, not be activated during the entire turn will assure that all fatigue points will be eliminated. Continuing with our example, Lan was activated during the turn and no cards were played to reduce his fatigue points. So now there is a penalty because this fifth fatigue point is in this zone here one strength point from Lan's core has to be eliminated. So the French will eliminate one of Lan's infantry cubes, and now Lan's core has a strength of three. And after that, we invert all of the core and commander markers that are inverted to their non-activated sides. Now we saw how the combat system works you count the number of cards that each side will flip and then you consult the cannon symbol to see if there's any fatigue point hits or strength point hits and sometimes uh, there will be none as shown in the middle card there but for those of you who prefer the game also includes a set of five dice for each side that you can use instead of using cards to resolve combat. And you can see here that the dice have different results here. Two fatigue point hits, here one, 
here you see one strength point hit and a fatigue hit and here you see uh, no fatigue or strength points lost so you can use the dice and what it is going to cause is that discarded cards will appear less frequently because you will not be using cards to resolve combat the game includes advanced rules which are called rules of the grognard these include rules for fog of war where instead of placing the blocks on their backs you place your blocks facing yourself and the enemy can only see their backs which provides more fog of war similar to those in traditional block games and also the game introduces cavalry vedettes which are sort of dummies in the game but they allow you to uh, reconnoiter the enemy spaces but if they come in contact with enemy units they are eliminated and in addition to the rule book the game includes a scenario book which contains 13 scenarios with each scenario having an illustration of where to place the initial units and includes the specific scenario rules scenario 13 allows you to link Shakos's previous Napoleon game Napoleon 1806 with this one and it also contains campaign history and design notes including historical notes to some of the cards in the game so this is Napoleon 1807 a game designed by Denis Savage and published by Shackles and I hope that this video has given you a good idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer this is Stuka Joe signing off for now thanks for watching